So hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Kyla Pools and I am the Heritage Program Coordinator for Casco Heritage Greenway. Um, I just want to thank you again for joining us today for our first talk of our 2023 Patasco Day celebration. Uh, our theme this year is Patasco Stories, which is a concentrated effort to explore the various resources, places, and materials that help us understand and illustrate the diverse stories and experiences of the Patasco Valley Heritage Area. So joining us today, we have Dr. Katherine Sterner. So Dr. Sterner is an anthropological archaeologist studying community organization and stone tool manufacture and use among pre-contact Native American groups, uh, particularly in the eastern woodlands of North America. She is an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice at Towson University. Uh, she's a proponent of public archaeology, collaborative interpretation with descendant communities, and engagement with avocational archaeologists. And if that's not enough, she is also the director of the Baltimore Community Archaeology Lab. So, today Dr. Sterner will be sharing some insights from the Natural History Society of Maryland's archaeology collections, uh, particularly those with ties to the Patasco Valley Heritage Area. So on that note, please join me in welcoming Dr. Katherine Sterner. Let me just get thanks everybody for coming out in this weather. Yikes. So it's, it's February? Or is it? Oh, it's March. So I've been, I've been saying it's February to my students for like the past, you know, month every time it's 70 degrees outside or something ridiculous. So um, thanks Kyla for the introduction and for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. This was a great opportunity for me to um, look at some specific materials from the area. And so one of my many hats that I wear is uh, I'm the collections manager for the Natural History Society of Maryland, which is an almost entirely volunteer organization. Um, some of you may be familiar, you may not. You'll hear a little bit about the Natural History Society of Maryland today. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the work I've been doing with their uh, collections there. I've only been at Towson University for this is my third year. Um, I did my PhD out in Wisconsin and uh, worked there for a few years after finishing up. So um, this is a, a return to the East Coast for me as an East Coaster by birth. So um, that gives me, I think, a different perspective on the archaeology of the Middle Atlantic uh, than some of the folks who have been doing this a little bit longer. Um, so what I wanted to do today is tell you guys a little bit about um, some of the early archaeology that was done in uh, the Patapsco Valley and some of what that early archaeology can tell us about uh, early life in the area. Uh, so we're kind of doing a little bit of archaeology of archaeology and uh, a little bit of what can that tell us about people in the past. So um, I think one of the things that's important to understand is that archaeology hasn't always been a profession, right? Uh, like most professions that we have nowadays, especially white collar type professions, um, archaeology hasn't been around as a profession for that long. So uh, well, it really wasn't professionalized until uh, you know. Uh, 1915 to 1930 or so is when you start to see the first um, university programs in archaeology and people actually studying to become archaeologists at universities. Prior to that, archaeologists are trained um, by curators of archaeology or anthropology at various museums in the United States and uh, in a sort of informal uh, apprenticeship way. And there's not very many uh, professional archaeologists to go around. There's nothing like uh, standards of the profession. And uh, Maryland doesn't really get any professional archaeologists for quite some time, despite our proximity to the Smithsonian. So 
One of uh, the earliest archaeologists in Maryland is William B. Marie, um, and he's uh, around 1886 to 1979. He is um, an amateur archaeologist, but uh, he's had no formal training, uh, and he manages to entangle himself with some other professional archaeologists uh, whereby he's able to, to gain some knowledge about how the profession works, what uh, you should be documenting, and how it should be done. So um, one of his big steps forward in that way, and this is William B. Marie here, um, <coughs> the, uh, is he worked on a survey by that was done by Warren K. Moorhead and Allison B. Skinner on the Susquehanna River um, in mostly 1914 and a couple years around there. And then they didn't publish a report on it for like 20 years, um, which is pretty par for the course, really. <laughs> uh, so this was done for the Hay Foundation the Museum of the American Indian. And keep in mind that professional archaeologists of 1915 to 1930, uh, we're still doing pretty much what we would call looting today, uh, where <laughs> they were collecting artifacts somewhat unsystematically, um, not really recording a great deal of information about where they came from, and certainly not uh, consulting with descendant communities about how those objects should be treated. So um, William B. Marie, had a lot of correspondence with other amateur archaeologists and documented a lot of early sites in Maryland. And a large portion of the Natural History Society of Maryland collections are derived from his work. But the uh, primary person who accumulated most of the Natural History Society archaeology collections was Richard Stearns. Um, and anyone who's ever uh, done archaeology in Maryland has worked on a Richard Stearns site at one point or another. Um, a former state archaeologist, Charlie Hall, once had a, a great quote in a workshop I was at where he said, I've never found a ground stone axe in the field, and I'm convinced that it's because Richard Stearns picked them all up. <laughs> uh, and he really did. We have a ton of ground stone axes in our collections at the Natural History Society. Uh, he was also not a professional archaeologist. Uh, he was in the Merchant Marine for a while, and then he was a commercial photographer. Uh, and he became the curator of archaeology for the Natural History Society in 1930. Uh, Natural History Society of Maryland started in 1929, so he was there pretty much at the very beginning. Um, and then he stayed on there until well into the 1950s. Um, he passed away in 1969. So the collections that we'll be talking about today uh, were accumulated by Richard Stearns. And um, the documentation that Stearns uh, accumulated was um, way above the bar for the time period. Uh, and it's really something that allows us to get a lot more information from the material that he collected than some of these professional expeditions that were going on at the same time period. So, a little bit about the Natural History Society of Maryland. Um, when the Natural History Society of Maryland was first founded in 1929, uh, they had a building in Druid Hill Park. You can see it here. It's a picture of it. It's the Maryland building. It's still there. It is not the uh, Natural History Society's building anymore. Uh, and they were always a volunteer organization. All of their curators were volunteer. They still are today. Uh, and it was really a, a naturalist kind of club, right, where people would bring their collections. Um, and they did a lot of uh, public programming and outreach and uh, had very robust membership into the 1950s. Uh, and then uh, with the death of the founder of the Natural History Society as well as post-World War II um, economic changes, there was a downturn in membership. And by the time the Maryland Science Center was being built, um, they 
were just running out of money, right? And it wasn't cheap having a building in Druid Hill Park. It's so weird drinking out of this. I feel like it should be milk. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I know. so we, um, when the Science Center came around, they were just like, okay, well, we don't really have a lot of money. Our members right now, you basically do the same stuff thing as us. Would you like our collections? And they're like, yeah, sure. Uh, and so Natural History Society gave them all their collections. And uh, then they found out that the Science Center was selling some of them off. Oh. Uh, and they were not pleased. <laughs> so they're like, well, we're going to take them all back. But unfortunately, they had sold their building in Druid Hill Park. So they had nowhere to put them. So they got a row home, and they stuck them in a bunch of beer boxes, <laughs> and stuck them in this row home for about uh, 40 years, <laughs> and where they sat until uh, they got some state funding to purchase a building in Overly uh, in 2006. Um, and this is the building you can see here. It's on Bel Air Road. And uh, it reopened to the public. It's mostly open for um, events and um, club meetings and that sort of thing right now. Uh, they have had a recent influx of investment from county, state, and we're hoping federal government um, to uh, completely rehab the building, bring it up to standards so that it can, the dream is to make it Maryland's Natural History Museum, which was, if you go back to 1930, always their dream. You can see the original sketches from 1930 of what they wanted it to look like. So it's a long time in the making, uh, but they're making some progress. So they unloaded everything from from these beer boxes into some cabinets. Uh, and as you might imagine, much information was lost <laughs> during the tumult of, right, you have, by our standards today, low informational collection from the original 1940s and 50s collections. Then you have those collections being shuffled off to the Science Center, then they're piled into a row home, and now they're unpacked uh, and they've gone through several permutations. So uh, the amount of information that we can garner from these collections is certainly not the same as uh, if I were pulling it out of the ground myself, right? Um, but there's a lot of value there. So uh, Stearns actually published several of the uh, Natural History Society of Maryland's proceedings. And uh, there are three that were written by Stearns. There were several others written by other curators. Uh, this is probably one of the more well-known ones that Stearns did well-known, like to me. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> to, uh, that Stearns has done on the Hughes site in Montgomery County. Um, there's a really good lecture that a colleague of mine, Lisa Krauss, uh, gave on Stearns and his work, and especially um, on his work at the Hughes site that's up on YouTube, if you, if you search for that. Um, it's really, does a great job of talking about um, the quality of scholarship that Stearns was producing at this time. And um, you can see that what's in these proceedings is variable depending on um, which ones you have. We published uh, one in 1940, again in 1943, and in 1949 um, were the three that he put out. And so there was this one was the first. 1943 was uh, the uh, Tidewater Villages of Maryland. Uh, and then the one that we'll be talking about today is 1949, uh, which is the Taxco Valley ones. And so you can see uh, <coughs> some of them. This is from uh, the 1943 publication. He's actually got uh, maps of inside of the site itself, as well as illustrations of the artifacts that he's recovering from the site. So uh, when he did his Lower Patasco survey, uh, he focused on uh, kind of four localities, right? So on the Patasco River itself, Deep Run, Stony Run, and then the Soapstone Branch. Um, so you can see, um, it might be a little tough to see on this one, I've got to zoom in on the next slide. You've got some sites marked here uh, and numbered. He numbered each site. I will say that those sites still have the same numbers in the state site database today. Uh, and 
would be, um, you can see where they're located along the river here. The main thing to keep in mind about the methods that Stearns was using in this particular uh, proceeding is that everything was surface collected. Okay? So that means that he went out to the sites, they're almost entirely uh, plowed fields at this time when he is there, and uh, he's just walking over the surface looking for stuff and collecting it from the surface. Um, that's not the same as what he was doing in some of his other work where he was actually conducting uh, excavations and records a little bit more detailed information. So of his three proceedings, this is probably the least detailed um, and the one which produced the uh, least amount of material. So uh, it's interesting to compare those. So the surface collection is key when we understand what kind of information we're going to get from him on this. Uh, so here you can see kind of a slightly zoomed in version of his map uh, that he drew of where all of the sites are that he located. So there were 25 sites that he documented. And um, you know, they start numbering up here by the railroad, you know, railroad uh, down uh, Deer Run, and, or Deep Run, sorry. And then um, you've got a bunch running down here down Stony Run, and then the, the uh, ones that we'll be talking about are up on the Patapsco River itself. Just because Stearns documented them does not mean we still have the stuff in our collections, okay? As I mentioned there, were a number of permutations that this collection has gone through over the years. Uh, so what he says he found and what we still have are not necessarily the same thing, okay? Um, but a combination of his documentation and uh, having the actual artifacts still allows us to generate a lot more information than if we just had one or the other, okay? So one of the things that Stearns really focused on was types of material that they found, right? So there's I think on the next slide I have this where we talk about, yeah, the types of information that he recorded. So some basic site location information, okay, which is, uh, I'll give you two examples of that, that we'll see exactly what he wrote for site location information. It's like three to four sentences, okay, so very basic. It's just telling you where the site is located so you could find it at that time. Uh, is not telling you about where anything within the site is located in relation to each other. Okay, so that nice map that I showed you of the interior of a site from his other proceeding, we have none of those. Okay, the only map that is in this proceeding from the Patasco Valley is um, the overall survey map. Okay, so basic site location information. He does discuss, and this is very important to archaeologists, current and past impacts to the sites. So by the time Stearns is writing this report, he's been visiting these sites for like a decade. Uh, and he has a good idea of what impacts there have been to the site integrity over that time. So there's one of the examples that we'll talk about. Uh, there's been extensive gravel quarrying. So by the time <coughs> Stearns is writing it up, even he says most of the site's gone due to gravel quarrying. But we picked up such and such artifacts before they destroyed it all, right? Um, and so he lets us know what the status of this site was in the 1940s, right? Which is really valuable to archaeologists who are coming back later and trying to document when was the site destroyed? What is the likelihood of there being anything left? What kind of impacts have there been to site integrity? Is it worth us trying to find out more from what's still left in the field, right? And then the two big things that he focuses on, which are typical of this time period, is <coughs> the stuff, right? The artifacts themselves, so what are they, right? Are they axes, are they projectile points, is it pottery? Um, and there is no attempt at this time to associate that with time period, okay? Uh, this is before Midwestern taxonomic method really takes off, if you're familiar with that at all, where people start classifying projectile points and pottery types based on their shape and the way that they're constructed. 
to figure out what time period they're from. Nobody started doing that yet. At this point, they're all just like, wow, this is really cool stuff. Look at this cool stuff I found. Uh, and that's about it. In a, a, maybe a decade, within the next decade, people really start um, emphasizing the importance of stratigraphy. So recognizing that the stuff that's buried up high in normal deposits is younger than the stuff that's down low, right? Just like when you're throwing out trash, the stuff in the beginning of the week is at the bottom, the stuff from the end of the week is at the top, right? Unless you're like digging around in there, and then that's where the gravel quarrying comes in, right? <laughs> but uh, so that comes in later, and that's something that we can add to Stearns's uh, information that he was not able to articulate at the time that he was writing. Okay, but only if we have the actual materials to look at to provide some of that information. And then lastly, raw materials. So he does get into um, one, they're especially into the chipstone raw materials, um, which is interesting to me. I'm a rocks person, so uh, I do lithic analysis anyway. But um, it's also interesting because at this time, people aren't really concluding much from that data about what the raw materials are. You know, when I look at raw materials from a particular site, what I want to know is, is it local? Is it non-local? Um, is it something that was really easy to make tools out of or really hard? Were they trading for it or were they procuring it themselves, right? Nobody's asking those questions or stating them in reports at this time. But they are really interested in what people are making things out of. And so he does specify that for pretty much um, all of his materials. And then lastly, pottery temper, um, which again, if you're familiar with how pottery is made, right, uh, you put um, some additional material in there besides the clay. So depending on where and when you are in time, that could be anything from crushed bone to fiber to shell to crushed uh, stone, which you call grit. Um, and that will keep it from exploding when you fire it or make it less likely to explode. Uh, and some things are better than others, right? Crush bone, not so good. Uh, doesn't really keep it from exploding very well. Shell, really good. Conducts heat very well, right? So the type of temper that people are using in their pottery gives us information about geographic location, you're not going to find shell in an area where there's no shells, probably, uh, and time period as well. Okay, he's not getting. He doesn't know that yet. That pottery temper is temporal, what we call temporally diagnostic, diagnostic of a particular time. Uh, but they're recording it. <coughs> okay, so I've got two sites that I'm going to talk to you guys about today, and the the collections are pretty different in terms of um, composition, size, uh, what they mean for our interpretation of the site itself. Okay, so the first one is 18AN20. Okay, so this was Stearns's number 20 site. Uh, and now we have what we call the Smithsonian Trinomial System for designating archaeological sites. So the way that works is every state has a number. Maryland is number 18. I did my PhD in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is 47. All right, so I have certain numbers memorized. Uh, and then the next two uh, notations are the letters of the county. So that's from Anne Arundel County. Okay, A and for Anne Arundel County. And then this is the 20th site that was recorded in Anne Arundel County. So every site has its own specific identifier that uh, archaeologists can use to identify it. Most of them also have names. Archaeologists can be a little sketchy when coming up with names, right? <laughs> when some places we've been, no one's allowed to come up with names anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I've worked on sites called My Brother's Birthday Site. Um, and the blinded by the light site, and, right, it's whatever anybody was into on that particular day. Uh, so we try to focus on landowner names now, it's usually pretty safe, but you never know. Um, so site numbers are consistent across time, and oftentimes the site will have multiple names through time. And you'll see on the next slide, don't go yet. <laughs> that 
uh, the name that is currently reported for this site in the state site files is not what uh, Stearns was calling it by. Stearns was calling this Pumphrey. Okay. Uh, so here's what he has. Here's a couple excerpts from his um, report. It says, the largest site which we have located on the Patapsco proper is just north of the highway bridge at Pumphrey and on the south bank of the river. That's, that's what we have for locational information, okay? Just enough to basically tell you where it is. You've got some important things there that are probably still going to be around, you know, 50 to 100 years later, the river itself, the highway bridge. Uh, that's better than a lot of the landmarks that some people have used to tell you where a site is. Go three paces from the rock and it's next to the pear tree, right? Not super helpful a hundred years later, but uh, this at least allows us to figure that out. Keep in mind when Stearns is recording these sites, he's just recording it as number 20 and no no other designation, no name, nothing like that. Okay, so when myself and the former curators of archaeology at the Natural History Society, Lisa Krauss and Jason Schellenhammer, were looking at these collections, the first thing we were trying to do was draw a connection between the materials, Stearns' report, and what's actually in the state site files, okay? Because we want to link it to any other records about that site. So the site number, helpful, that those are always numbered the same, right? Uh, sometimes though, Stearns' sites get split into multiple new site numbers, uh, or they get combined into site numbers, right? So um, locational information is really critical because it helps us match up his records with more modern records of where a site is located. And location is important, because if you're trying to figure out things like, is this raw material source close by? Uh, what other areas are people interacting with? If you don't have a spatial point of focus on the landscape, then it's just floating in space somewhere, right? It's somewhere in Anne Arundel County. Um, we, have, we certainly have plenty of collections that we have maybe county level locational information, sometimes just state level, sometimes absolutely nothing at all, right? Where we have no idea where they came from. And that really limits what you can say about a particular set of materials. So the locational information, basic but good. This site has been destroyed in part by commercial operations as much gravel has been removed from it, leaving a large rectangular pond in an area where once we found many artifacts. So even by the time Stearns is writing, uh, the site's been mostly destroyed. Right? So the artifacts that he collected, um, he was collecting early on, probably. Or he accumulated from other people's collections, and uh, they donated them to the Natural History Society. He does not specify. Uh, and then lastly, at this locality, we have found axes, celts, several fragments of gorgets, banner stones, hammer stones, and numerous arrow points. Um, he surprisingly does not mention pottery here. We do have two pieces of pottery from this site. Um, so that's a little odd. But uh, he's also got various illustrations of things that sometimes don't match up, right? So you can put all of the pieces together to get a more complete um, description of what you found. Kyla? I'm, I'm sorry. Can yeah. you describe the words? What those things are? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, axes, pretty straightforward, right? Celts, just like an axe, but without uh, a, um, a groove in it for the shaft to fit around. Uh, so that's basically what that is. Uh, fragments of gorgets, if archaeologists knew what those were, I would tell you. Um, <laughs> gorgets are, uh, they are these, um, usually made at, in this area, they're usually made out of slate, uh, flat, I think maybe they are pendants, they've got one or two holes drilled in the middle of them, they can be you know, as big as about the size of my hand, usually much flatter than that. Um, and uh, you know they would have drilled the holes in them. So there's two prevailing interpretations of what they're used for. One is just decoration, um, you wear it, 
Two is um, what's called a, an atlatl weight. Uh, so if you've ever heard of an atlatl, it's a spear thrower. Basically, before people were using the bow and arrow, they had a, a shaft with a hook in the end of it, and they would fit that into the end of a five-foot you know, spear, and then that would extend your reach when you throw the spear. Uh, and there's some uh, evidence from studying modern hunter-gatherer populations that people um, attached weights to those um, ab levels to give them a little more force when they're thrown. Okay. There's really no evidence that says that the gorgets were used for that, uh, but some people like to say that. And so they like to say that about banner stones too. So banner stones, I don't think, we don't have any banner stones from this collection. Um, but if you have, feel free to hit me up for pictures of banner stones because we have a ton of unfinished banner stones in the Natural History Society collections. They're also drilled, so this is probably where this thought is coming from that they're at model weights. Um, but instead, they've got kind of like a. If you imagine that it's it's this shape, right? Oh, this one's kind of more symmetrical. It's this shape. Uh, a gorget, the holes are drilled through this way, okay? But with a banner stone, the hole is drilled through this way. And so you could have fit it on the shaft itself and would have set on there. Um, some of them seem really big to be at battle weights. Uh, and they're very fancy looking, you know, very decorative. So um, whether or not they were actually at battle weights, we really um, but that's the prevailing opinion right now, because we don't know any better. Hammer stones, the stones used for breaking other stones, and of course arrow points are pretty straightforward. We'll talk about um, the difference between arrow points, and spear points, problems with names like that um, in a second when we talk about the materials themselves. So, 18A and 20 is also now known as big holly branch. I have not inquired as to why. Um, and there's been other <clears throat> work done at the site besides Stearns. So the first work, like much of uh, what was done in Maryland, was done by Talbot D. Jones, who was an insurance underwriter, uh, and used this as an opportunity to tramp all over the place. <laughs> and. Uh, collect lots of artifacts on various people's land. Uh, and so people like Marie and Stearns uh, interviewed Jones, and Jones donated various parts of his collections to various places. Uh, and so we've gotten a lot of information about sites like Big Holly Branch from Jones' original records. Right? So he's the first record we have of the site in 1905. And then Stern shows up in the 1940s. Uh, and then Tyler Bastian and Wayne Clark show up, not at the same time, but both in 1970. I'm not going to get into like the strange, sordid history between the Maryland Geological Survey and the Maryland Historical Trust, but they've, they've sort of meshed now. Right? And so we had two different uh, facets of state government doing survey of our professional survey of archaeological sites up through the 70s. Um, Clark frequently um, surface collected the sites that he documented. Um, as to where those materials are, though, that's somewhat a little more difficult to determine. Um, so we do have information about the site based on their um, investigations there. So, Here's what we know based on the state site file. Okay, so if you're not aware, all states have uh, an archaeological site file. Some of them are electronic, some of them are not. Don't worry. Uh, but <laughs> Michigan. Uh, so some of them are still on paper copies where you have to go to the State Historic Preservation Office and search through their files if you want to find out information about a known archaeological site. Um, most states are electronic now, where uh, if you are a professionally credentialed archaeologist, you can gain access to the state site files, and you can search based on various criteria, location, or time period, or name of the site. Um, 
to see what the state knows about this known site. Okay. So uh, here you can see that this is where the site is based on the current state site files information. And the information that we have, uh, you know, there's two basic things that I look for um, when we're, we're talking about the site. Uh, especially when we're focused on what the materials are coming out of the site. One, when was it occupied? So what were the time periods? And I'll give you guys dates for these time periods in a couple slides. Um, so the temporal information we have is there's boxes that are checked. One is checked that says archaic, and there's one that says late woodland. Um, and these are apparently are based on, I think, uh, Clark's drawings of late woodland pottery from the site. Maybe that's where the pottery came from that's in our collections. I really don't know. Uh, and some middle to late archaic projectile points that he um, also surface collected. In the state fi site file, it specifically says that Stearns collected all this stuff from the site, but those collections have been lost uh, because this was being, that site file was being updated in the 1970s when everything was in beer boxes <laughs> in a row home, right? So none of that would have been accessible to someone trying to update a state site file. And they also mentioned um, the raw materials that uh, chipstone tools were made out of. They just mentioned these three, chert, jasper, and quartz. Um, around here, somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of your chipstone tools are made out of quartz, which is sad because it's not really nice to work with um, when you're trying to, to chip pieces off of it. It doesn't really work very well, uh, but it's what they had, so they were suddenly making good use of it. And um, so when you have something that's not quartz, that gives you a lot of information about um, what other areas they're in contact with. So when I took a look at the um, materials that we have from 18A and 20 in the NHSM collection, this is what we have. So I'll do some definitions here first to how we kind of broke things up. Um, Bifaces are what I think people would often think of as um, like a, a spear point um, or a knife or something like that, but I don't like to attach um, a functional name to it. So it's something like, this uh, and it's been chipped on both faces, okay, this side and on that side. But I can't really imagine sticking this on. I got it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a rock. Uh, so an arrow point or a spear shaft, right? It's a little big for that. So if I have something like that that's not clear on function, um, then I just like to designate it as a biface, right? It tells you how it was made, but not what it was used for. Um, chopper is exactly what it sounds like. It is too ugly to be called an axe or uh, a celt, and it is uh, probably used for chopping based on its shape. Um, Demitage is your, are the pieces that come off when you are chipping your tool down to size. So that's all your debris. You've got two pieces of that. These guys almost never collected debitage uh, during the time that Stearns was working, so it's a little shocking we have any of that. Um, one drill, which you can see there in the picture, it's bust, the tip is busted, which is what always happens to drills. So this is the end that you would stick in the shaft, and then it would go up to a point in there. Um, I think I brought the drill. Um, so at the end, you guys can come out and check some uh, there's a nutting stone, which I did bring. Uh, it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. There's a little indentation in the center of the stone on both sides. They used it on both sides uh, for breaking nuts. Um, and they also used it for some, as a hammer stone, too. There's evidence of use all around the sides. Um, two pipe stems. So uh, they're, they're clay pipe stems, so that suggests there were some historic folks there, post-European contact. Um, Pottery, two pieces. Not sure where they came from. Stearns never talks about them. 50 projectile points. This is what everybody picks up, right? And then um, scraper, one scraper, so uh, just for scraping hides, scraping wood, that sort of thing. And uh, two unifaces, so just like a biface, but only shaped on 
one face, not both faces. Uh, so again, where I didn't feel comfortable attributing function, uh, but I can tell you something about the way it was made. Um, and then definitely expanded our raw materials that things are made out of. Um, so obviously a lot of emphasis on quartz and uh, a lot of emphasis on rhyolite. That's not too surprising for this area, but most people are, especially the rhyolite that we have, is rhyolite that's coming from South Mountain, Pennsylvania. Um, so that gives us an idea of what that connection is there. Yeah. Would that have been a village site? Yes. So <laughs> archaeologists like to say, if there's pottery, it's a village. All right, so um, if you just have some projectile points, you know, maybe they're out hunting, you know, the hunting camp sort of thing, but if you've got pottery there, then yes. Um, and Stearns interpreted this as a village as well, and that's how it's interpreted in the site file as well, just because of the quantity of material there. Um, so yeah, this one's definitely a village. Yeah. And where would the Jasper has come? Come from well, that's interesting. Materials. So there's a jasper quarry uh, kind of northeast of here, uh, a little ways. But um, most, I found that folks, in, unless they're in the Delaware drainage, were not using most of the jasper from that quarry. Uh, I, I suspect because of territoriality. Um, so it's on a tributary of the Delaware. And so folks that are in the Susquehanna drainage are not using it. Um, yeah. Wouldn't there be a lot of uh, animal bones in a village site? Yes. Those ever they found? never collected them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so some of it's a preservation issue. Yeah. If your soil's too acidic um, or there's too much freeze thaw or something like that, then that's what's going to go first are the bones. Um, rocks and pots last a lot longer. But um, it's also that these guys um, just were not collecting mm -hmm. animal bone. They'll mention it sometimes. Yeah, we found a bunch of animal bone. But that's it. They won't mention the, the species or anything like that, unfortunately. Yeah. So, yeah. So is this a, uh, a temporary village? Well, can you do the next? So, uh, <laughs> so... Based on the, the diagnostic, temporally diagnostic pieces that we have from the site, right, that tell us what time periods it was occupied, it was occupied on and off, not continuously, uh, from the Middle Archaic, so maybe as early as 7000 BC, uh, certainly by, you know, 3500, 3700 BC, people were there, and uh, consistently on and off through the late woodland, so up until uh, 8950 to somewhere in the 1600s potentially. Certainly in the 1600s if we've got those pipe stems, right? Uh, so was it a long-term occupation? Yes, but long-term occupations for uh, native peoples in um, the eastern woodlands, the, the Americas, meant for, you know, maybe a generation or two, and then they were gone, and then people would come back. So this, this sort of permanence of place where um, there's institutional memory, and people are like, this was a good spot, we're going to come back to this spot, right? But if you exhaust the resources in an area, or the neighbors aren't so nice right now, um, you're going to move your village somewhere else. Um, and there's also a lot of seasonal um, dispersal and aggregation where people are coming together in large villages in the summertime when resources are plentiful and then splitting off into smaller, um, you know, single family units uh, in the winter time, which are easier to support. You don't need as big of a house to heat, all those sorts of things. So that's a great question though. Um, so yes, as long term as their sites get, as village sites get, this would have been one of the long-term ones. Not as extensive as some other sites in the area that we have collections from at Natural History Society. I would say the most extensive one I can think of is Conowingo um, on, Susquehanna, on the Susquehanna River, um, where we have uh, 
dozens of banner stones, uh, dozens of axes, right? So they were really, uh, and hundreds of soapstone bowl fragments. It was really a production center for people. So, you know, it's a sliding scale, just like our, our settlements are today, right? Uh, so, so that's the, the temporal affiliation. That really expanded what we knew before, right? So previously it just said archaic, now we know that it's as early as the middle archaic, right? So we can go back to 7,000 BC potentially. And that's based on um, some of the, the projectile points that we have, right? So some, uh, the base of your projectile points, and we call them projectile points because we assume that they were hafted onto a shaft and thrown or fired at something, but we uh, don't want to assume the medium by which they were fired, and then we don't have to call them arrowheads or spearheads or something like that, so we just use them all encompassing projectile points. So the, what we call the proximal end, which is the hafting end that you stick in the shaft, is temporally diagnostic. It changes over time. Um, and if you're not familiar and you're interested in this, I would highly suggest you search for um, Diagnostic Artifacts of Maryland. Uh, there's a really great ID website um, that the state has uh, for identifying um, the different time periods of pottery and stone tools. So, you know, depending on what the base looks like, right, is it notches on the sides, is it a fiber kit base, is it thinned, you know, um, all of that can give you an idea of what time period it is. All right, so we got one smaller site to talk about. This one won't take quite as long. So this is, this is literally all the information we have about this site in Stearns' report. The next site of any importance, right? So some sites just don't even get talked about at all. Uh, it's about one mile and a half up river from Pet Wayne's. So then I include in there, that's site number 24. This site uh, extends along the river for a distance of a quarter mile, but we did not find such a concentration of material as at Pumphrey, the site that we just talked about. All that we found at this place were arrow points. I always would like expect him to be hanging his head while he's writing that. <laughs> All around for arrows. Meanwhile, archaeologists are like, you found an actual artifact, oh my god. So um, you know, this is all we have from 18A and 24. So what do we know based on uh, the um, information that has been collected since the Stearns' report? Good old Talbot Jones was there in 1905. Stearns just followed him around, right? Uh, and it was working really well for him. And then, lo and behold, Wayne Clark and Tyler Bastion were back in 1970s. And they actually excavated three units uh, and found, again, they were dissatisfied with the amount of material that they found, too, in comparison to some of the sites in the area. And then many of you may know uh, Steph Sperling, who at the time was at Lost Towns Project and now is the, um, the county archaeologist for uh, Prince George's County. She visited the site in 2009, took photos, and uh, confirmed that yeah, it's, it's pretty destroyed, um, which is what Stearns uh, was indicating earlier on as well. So here's what the state site file says. Uh, we've got a little more and a little less information. So the temporal uh, components, they tell us that there was an archaic occupation, and then there are early, middle, and late woodland occupations. I am not sure exactly where these designations came from. Uh, so Clark, uh, again, was out there surface collecting, and uh, he had some middle and late woodland shirts and points, and it says that in the site file. So I know that that's where the middle and late woodland uh, check boxes came from. Groundstone axes are, people start making those in the archaic. So if you've got groundstone axes at a site, you've got an archaic site. Uh, so, okay, the fact that Talbot Jones had some groundstone axes. All right, you can get archaic out of that. I don't know where the early woodland designation came from. Um, 
the material that we have from this site at NHSM is very limited. Um, Kyla, if you want to show the next slide. This is it. <laughs> so there are actually, I take it back, there are two more uh, artifacts, these two, that are not temporally diagnostic, <laughs> that I did not stick on this slide, but I did bring them. Um, and, but there are some temporally diagnostic points. So um, we have this really sweet Charleston corner match point, which is an early archaic. Um, we'll talk about dates on the next slide. And then a uh, Brewerton side notch, which is late archaic. We've got two of these Lavocas, which are also late archaic. And then one little late woodland guy. Um, anytime you find a triangle, those are mostly late woodland, um, which is later stuff. Those are your classic arrow points, uh, as we think of them. So what does this tell us that we did not already know from just reading the state site file? Uh, one, there's an early archaic occupation. That's early, right? So somewhere between 9,500 and 7,000 BC, there were people here at this site. Um, definitely a late archaic occupation that you know comprises uh, the largest proportion of these seven artifacts <laughs> are late archaic pieces. Uh, and then definitely late woodland as well from our one triangular point. The coolest thing for me, I think, is um, one, that this, the Charleston point, and this other one that's not really temporally diagnostic, I don't know what happened to it, is definitely um, heat treated. They're made from really nice non-local trimmed, like definitely not local to the Middle Atlantic period, <laughs> nicer than that. Where could they be from? Well, uh, for, uh, you know, you're going to go a little bit further west, I'm going to say, you know, West Virginia, into Kentucky, somewhere in there, uh, most likely. Uh, so this is a, probably a very different type of site than what we have at the Big Holly Branch, right? Um, uh, oh, no, go back. So if you want to um, compare those, right, Big Holly Branch has a high concentration of artifacts, wide variety of artifact types, uh, mostly local stuff, right? So that suggests people staying in one place for a longer period of time, right, and mostly hanging out with each other. Whereas uh, here at Patapsco Lakes, we've got a very small concentration of people that were pretty good at making projectile points, bringing in some non-local raw materials with them, so that suggests they were traveling around a little bit more. Um, and they're occupying the site mostly earlier. We don't have a continuous occupation here like we did at uh, Big Holly Branch. Here we've got people very early on in the archaic, and then nobody comes back until the late woodland, right? Um, and that's not too surprising when you think of this as probably a hunting camp, right? Um, it's gonna be a little bit harder to find. What is a good hunting camp in the late archaic uh, is probably a good hunting camp anywhere, but you're not as likely to stumble across it because when you're looking for a good place to put a village, you get a lot more constraining variables than you do for a hunting camp. So what can we take away from all of this information, right? Uh, this is a great place to live, <laughs> the Potomac <laughs> Valley, right? A lot of sites here, a lot of people living here at different times uh, and in relatively high concentrations, right? A lot of combination of wetland and upland resources uh, that stayed consistent throughout prehistory. Um, so that, that's not really news to me or probably any of you, right? Um, one of the things that I think uh, I would really like to um, impress upon people is the importance of these legacy collections, right? So um, the flashy part of archaeology is the field work, right? Going out and getting to dig stuff up. Um, and then as the lab work continues, participation dwindles. And then uh, once you get to the report writing, like nobody's interested anymore. <laughs> uh, and that's really unfortunate because uh, you lose all of this information then uh, that we have access to 
and uh, is really an invaluable resource because in many cases these sites are destroyed uh, and no or no longer accessible. Right in the case of Conowingo, uh, it's right by the dam. I mean, you can't get to it. I talked to them; they were not pleased with the idea of letting me down there. <laughs> right, so they don't want to accidentally open the floodgates on somebody. I think is their main concern. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that's a site that's mostly been washed away by floods uh, because of the placement of that dam. Uh, and Stearns has hundreds, we have over 800 artifacts from Conowingo. Um, so that, and there, as Charlie Hall would say, it's the kind of stuff that archaeologists don't actually find, right? Yeah, I, can, I have never found a ground stone axe in you know, 20 years of doing archaeology. <laughs> I, mean, it's the, I, I did find a uh, really cool platform pipe one time, just tumbled out of the screen. Those are the kind of artifacts people don't just find in excavations. We find a lot of debitage and a lot of pot shirts. And, Right. <laughs> and then the pre stuff is the stuff that farmers in their fields are going by and they're like, oh, I see that axe because it yeah. picks right up, right? It's easy to see. So the kind of stuff that these guys were collecting, yes, you know, it's not, um, doesn't adhere to the kind of standards that we are proponents of today in archaeology where we want a spectrum of data, a wide variety of material types, right? But the, the cool stuff that people were picking up in Starnes' day also has a lot to, to tell us. Uh, but I think there's a, a long history in archaeology of I picked up the cool stuff, I put it in a box somewhere, and then Indiana Jones style, right, it goes into the warehouse and you never see it again. Um, so I think it's really important for us to, to showcase how much information can be gained from going back and looking at these legacy collections. And then lastly, uh, more information could have been gained if he would tell us about what was going on within the site boundaries, right? So in his uh, 1943 proceedings, which were earlier, so I don't understand why he didn't do a better job in 1949, but you know, I don't want to speak ill of the dead. So uh, he did document a lot of um, intra-site maps, right, of here's where there was a hearth and two pits over here, right? Um, and that gives us a lot more information about how the site was organized and what kinds of activities people were doing there, as opposed to just looking at something like this and being like, well, it's pointy. They probably used it to stab stuff, right? If I found it stuck in someone's leg, then I would have a much better idea of what it was used for. Uh, but since that spatial context is lost, uh, then we don't have that kind of information. We're forced to rely on um, sometimes very nebulous assumptions about what the function of an object was just based on its shape. So I think documenting that information about um, where things are coming from, not just in a, a nice oval on a map that says this spot on a Tobo map, but also what was the distribution of material within that spot. Um, you know, is there a concentration of projectile points in one area and a concentration of pottery in another area? Um, that kind of information is really essential for teasing out more of those details about what kind of site was it and how long was it occupied, what were they doing there. Um, yeah. So that's it. I have some acknowledgments, mostly my students uh, who have been tirelessly working to catalog all of the archaeology collections at the Natural History Society in Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, so here you can see a couple of the work and these guys um, did uh, all of the initial cataloging of these materials for, for this, uh, and my husband who late night one night helped me do some of the projectile point IDs because he doesn't get to look at artifacts enough lately. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. some time for questions before we get into that. I just want to highlight two of our other upcoming lectures in this Patapsco Day series. Um, so March 16th we'll have Marcus Nix, the curator of the Howard County Center for African American Culture, coming to give a talk about some of the history of, seg of education and segregation um, within Howard County. 
Uh, and then on March 22nd, we'll be having local author Ned Tillman uh, giving a book talk on his most recent uh, book, A Good Endeavor. Um, so both of these events will be here at the library again. You can register via uh, Eventbrite. We've got flyers with more info on the registration table. So with that, if anyone has any questions, we can get to them. Otherwise, please take snacks on your way out. That's yeah, less for you to put in the car. To come up and look at some of the stuff too before you go. Yeah. Yeah.